Good morning, I'm Chris Flanagan and today I want to talk to you about intubating the critically ill infant. Now I've been a paediatric intensivist now for around about seven years and on average about once a year I'll go out to the district general hospital to a child that the local team has not been able to intubate and they're managing the child with either a face mask or a laryngeal mask. And what I want to do today is share two things that all those patients had in common because I think it's going to help you identify an at-risk group that you might not have realised was an at-risk group. And then it's also going to give you a strategy to manage these patients and also hopefully you avoid you getting into problems in the first place. So the first thing that all these patients had in common was that they were all under one year of age. And this really shouldn't come as a big surprise to us because we've known for quite some time that children under one year are much more likely to have a Cormac Lehan at grade 3 or 4 airway. So that's a view where either you can only see the epiglottis or you can't even see the epiglottis. And in fact, children under one year are six times more likely to have that view compared to an older child. And difficult tracheal intubation, which is defined as two or more attempts at failed direct laryngoscopy, um, is a fairly common event. And in fact, in this study, it occurred in up to 5.8% of patients under 60 weeks of age. So just over a year of age. So fairly common risk factors for difficult intubation in patients under one year of age. So today I'm going to focus mostly on patients under one year of age. And the points that I'm going to make apply particularly to this age group. Although a lot of them are relevant to older children as well. So the second thing that all the children had in common was that when actually I went out to intubate them using the technique that I'm going to recommend that you use, all of them apart from one were a straightforward grade one easy intubation on the first attempt and one of them was a little bit fiddly but still didn't have any problem intubating them with the technique that I'm going to recommend. So before we get on to what I think the solution is, I want to take a look at what the actual problem is. And I want you guys to go over to the YouTube chat now, take a look at the baby we've got up on the screen, and why do you think this kid would be difficult to intubate? So I think the first thing to say, the kid is obviously smaller, and everything being smaller is going to be much more difficult than doing it on a large scale. But it's not really just as simple as that. There's a lot of anatomical differences. So you're going to have a larger tongue, a more anterior larynx, and you've got this large floppy epiglottis. And when you combine that with a lax glossoepiglottic ligament, if you were to put a laryngoscope blade into the vallecula, it's only going to partially lift the epiglottis up out of the way. So that's a pretty big problem when you try to intubate these kids. Again, with everything being smaller, it's more delicate and fragile. So trauma is much more likely to cause swelling. Secretions, again, in these smaller patients are not only more common, but they give you much more of a problem. They can completely block your view. Um, either with direct or video laryngoscopy and make intubation impossible where in a larger patient normally you're able to see past the secretions. There's a few differences in the positioning you're going to have to do as well. Normally a child like this you're going to probably put a shoulder roll whereas the older patient you'll have a pillow under their head. So you're going to position them in a slightly different way. Quite a big one is that this kid has a really small reservoir of oxygen that you can put into their lungs in terms of pre-oxygenating and they use oxygen incredibly quickly. So even with a well child with good pre-oxygenation, you would expect their sats to be plummeting even with slick intubation. Take that sick child with bad lungs, it's going to be a completely nightmare to intubate them in a timely manner without them desaturating. And probably one of the biggest factors that's often overlooked is the majority of these kids are intubated by somebody who is mostly used to intubating adults in a routine manner in the operating theatre. So take this very small, very sick patient and you're doing a task that you don't do on a regular basis, it's incredibly stressful. And if it's incredibly stressful, you're not going to be performing at your best. So there's an absolute multitude of factors why these kids are difficult to intubate. So moving on to what the solution is, and the solution that's been handed down through the ages is you use a Miller blade to intubate the children. It's designed to go under the epiglottis and lift the epiglottis directly. So you don't need to worry about the large floppy epiglottis and the lax glossy epiglottic ligament if you're going to be putting the laryngoscope blade under the epiglottis and lifting it. So if that was the solution to the problem, I wouldn't be given this talk today. As I've already mentioned, the majority of these patients are intubated by people who are used to intubating adults. 
you put your blade into the vernacular, you give it a lift, and you get a good view of the laryngeal opening. When these small children, you're having to do a completely different technique, you're using a different device in a kid who's going to desaturate incredibly quickly in a really stressful scenario. So it's not a big surprise tracheal intubation in these children fails on a fairly high percentage of times. I do have a few tricks and perils that I can give you when you're using a Miller blade to intubate these kids. I think the first one is if you are struggling to lift the epiglottis, and as I've mentioned, this is a difficult technique to do if you're not doing this on a regular basis. What I would recommend you do is put the tip of the blade into the vallecula, just like you would do at an older patient or an adult. As we've mentioned, you're probably not going to get a perfect view in these kids. But if you combine it with some external laryngeal manipulation, I have a nice video to show you how effective this is later on. And you've got a stylet in your tube. Nine times out of ten, you're probably going to get your tube in. The view is not going to be pretty, it's not going to be the best view you can get, but it's going to be good enough to get the job done. Another option that you have is to actually use your tried and trusted curve blade that you use on a regular basis. Again, because of the anatomy that we've already mentioned, you're probably not going to get a great view. But as we've mentioned, if you combine some external laryngeal manipulation with a stylet in the tube, the majority of times you're going to get a view that's adequate enough to do the intubation. And I know a number of paediatric intensivists and anaesthetists who this is their preferred method to intubate children of all sizes, and they've used it with quite a bit of success. So this is a very viable option, and certainly would have been something I would have recommended so that you could consider maybe up until about six or seven years ago. What I'm now recommending that you do is use a video laryngoscope. And I'm going to go a step further and say not only use a video laryngoscope, but use a video laryngoscope with a traditional shaped Macintosh or Miller blade, i.e. not a hyperangulated video laryngoscope. And I'll go on to explain my reasons for that. So a hyperangulated video laryngoscope, as you can see some on the screen, you've got a really steep bend and it's designed to act like a periscope and let you see round a corner. You pass it over the tongue midline without displacing the tissues and it gives you a beautiful view of the laryngeal structures in even difficult airways. It does come with some problems because you're working around a corner your tube delivery is much more difficult than with direct laryngoscopy or traditional shaped video laryngoscope. And there's a number of methods out there to help with that. One is you'll see some of them have a little channel on the side to help direct the tube around the corner to the cords. Or the other ones, you have to use a really steep bend in your stylet. You almost, what you want to do is match the bend to the shape of the video laryngoscope blade that you're using. There is a problem to doing this in that you have less control of the endotracheal tube at all stages. So one, getting the tube to the cord, two, getting the tube through the cord, and three, actually getting the tube to go down into the trachea is much more difficult than with direct laryngoscopy or with video laryngoscopy with a traditional shaped blade. So as you can see in this video, there's a bit less control over getting the tube to the cord. When you do get it through the cord, it doesn't go down into the airway with a stylet in it because of the steep bend that we've made in the tube. So you are generally going to have to withdraw the stylet back slightly before you're able to advance the tube through the cords. And as well, quite often you do get the tube through the cords, you pull the stylet back as you can see in this video, but because of the angle of approach that you've taken, it's quite often the tube will still not go through and you're going to actually have to rotate it and a bit of fiddling about to try and get the tube to go through the cords. So, as we mentioned, this is a time critical scenario. You've got less time to put the tube in. There's more secretions potentially blocking your view. It's a pretty stressful scenario. And you do not want to be fiddling about manipulating tubes, pulling stylets back, and then rotating tubes in. You want to deliver the tube quickly and intubate the child as quickly as possible. And that's the way, reason why I would not recommend this technique for routine intubation in critically unwell children. It does have its place. Um, if we look at this video of a child been intubated with an incredibly difficult airway, this would not be possible with a video laryngoscope with a traditional shaped blade. We weren't able to get a view at all. The view here is not good, but we are able to do the intubation with a hyperangulated video laryngoscope. And for me, this is where I would use it, the extremely difficult airway, 
and that is its place as far as I am concerned. What I want to do now is show you a video of a child being intubated with a Miller blade with the C-Mac and I want you to look at the difference in the tube delivery. The tube just goes straight down, no manipulation of the stylet and you're back out again. So that's the big advantage of a traditional shaped blade because you actually just place the tongue to the side and make a straight passage to the cords you don't need a steep bend in your stylet. You've got a straight passage where you can just manipulate the tube and get the intubation done nice and slickly. And when you think of the child who is going to desaturate really quickly, this is really what you want. There is a common misconception and that is that if you've got a video laryngoscope blade with a Miller or Macintosh shaped design, that it won't offer any significant advantage in terms of you to direct laryngoscopy. That is not true. When you're using direct laryngoscopy, you have to line up all the axes with your eye as the camera. With video laryngoscopy, the camera is right down almost at the tip of the blade, so there's less of a distance between your view and the camera, and less things that you have to actually line up. So with video laryngoscopy, the traditional shaped blade, you will get a significantly better view, a nice highly magnified view of the paediatric airway, with much less effort than direct laryngoscopy. And in fact, using video laryngoscopy with a traditional shape blade would be my preferred technique up to a moderately difficult airway because of the ease of tube delivery. And it's only for the extremely difficult airways that I prefer a hyperangulated blade for its improved view. And I'll deal with the issues of getting the tube to the cords because the advantage of the improved view outweigh any problems with tube delivery. Another important point to mention with a video laryngoscopy using a traditional shape blade, in particular with a Miller shaped blade, is that you don't actually have to lift the epiglottis with the Miller shaped blade. And in fact, I would recommend that you don't. It's completely different to direct laryngoscopy because as we already mentioned, the position of the camera is at the end of the blade and not your eye all the way up here. So with the blade in the vlacchio, you will actually get a good view of the laryngeal opening as you can see in this particular video. And the big advantage of that is you can use exactly the same technique as you use in your adult patients. Not only that, you can use the same device and I would encourage you to use a video laryngoscope for intubating your adult patients that is compatible with small paediatric patients. So when you come to intubate a sick child, you're using a device that you're familiar with, just a slightly smaller blade, and using exactly the same technique as you use in your adult patients. And that is a recipe for success rather than failure, which I think will happen if you use a different blade with a different technique in a stressful scenario. So unfortunately, there is some problems to video laryngoscopy. It's not all benefits. And one of the biggest problems is if the airway is soiled, be it vomit, secretions, or blood in the airway, you're gonna to to get a much more difficult view than with direct laryngoscopy. And in fact, your camera can very quickly become contaminated, making intubation impossible. You're gonna to have to take it out, clean it, and potentially put it back in again. And that's gonna result in a delay in intubation. There is a few te techniques and tips that I can give you to help avoid that. Um, one of the things I'll quite often do if one of my registrars is doing the intubation is before they'll put the blade in the mouth, I'll go down with the anchor sucker and clear out any secretions that are there. And that way they're much less likely just to shove the camera blade into a big pool of secretions, which I know are highly likely to be there in the back of the throat of a critically ill child, block the view, and then have to take the camera out, clean it, and have another go. Um, the other thing that you can do is try and stay high and dry, as you can see in this video. So rather than plunging the blade into the big pool of secretions and contaminating the camera, working your way down gradually. If there's secretions there, you can suction them out of the way as you go. Um, and you can actually see in this video, we ended up in too far and actually had to withdraw once we were able to get the view. But importantly, we didn't contaminate the camera along the way. The third thing that I can recommend to you is use a good video laryngoscope, um, one that has a good high definition. In adults, you can get away with a poor quality device because you're generally able to pick out the structures and secretions aren't a big problem. In a child, the better the definition that you have, the more likely you are to see past the secretions, the more likely you are to be able to identify the structures and orientate you in the airway. But there will, however, come a time with video laryngoscopy, no matter what you do, at a moment that you don't expect it, your view is gonna be completely blocked by secretions and you're gonna to have to have a backup plan. You might be able to take the device out and clean it, but when you put it back in, you might have exactly the same problem. 
So my advice to you is always have a direct laryngoscope immediately available um, should you get yourself into trouble. And as far as I'm concerned, it's not good enough to have it in the trolley. I always have it out and ready and sitting beside me when I'm doing video laryngoscopy. And I can think of a child I was intubating recently. Um, it was a sick cardiac baby and I was expecting a difficult physiological intubation, but a straightforward anatomical intubation. I had started them on a low dose peripheral adrenaline. Everything was just right and we got the kid off to sleep. When I put the laryngoscope blade into the back of the mouth, I was met with milk pouring up. I contaminated the camera, I took it out, cleaned it, suctioned, went back in, the camera was contaminated again. At this stage, the sats were starting to fall, I could hear the heart rate starting to fall, and I reached for the direct laryngoscope that I had sitting over to my right, put it in. Again, the milk was coming up faster than I could suction it away, but the advantage of direct laryngoscopy is you can see past some of the um, things that are obscuring the airway, be it blood, milk or vomit or secretions. And I was able just about to pick up an epiglottis and pass the tube blindly into the pool of milk onto the epiglottis and feel it into the airway. And at that stage, the kid was already pretty bradycardic and had that tube have not gone in, I would have got myself into real trouble. So preparation is really key. And my advice to you is always have a direct laryngoscope out if you're planning to use video laryngoscopy. Another common misconception is that should the view become blocked with whatever in the airway, you're gonna be able to switch over and use the device as a direct laryngoscope. And while you might get away with that in adults, you won't get away with it in small patients that we're talking about today in the older ones. The reason for that is there's no device on the market that is as thin as a traditional direct laryngoscope. They're all slightly thicker and that creates problems in that you, one, it blocks your view slightly because the device is thicker. And the other thing, because it's thicker, it interferes with your tube delivery. So if you're using this as a training tool for your trainees and you're blinding them to the screen, getting them to do direct laryngoscopy, well, that's fine in adults where you have plenty of room. In a child, and in particular a small infant that we're talking about today, you're making the intubation significantly more difficult. And again, I can think of a case that I did a number of years ago it was maybe a child about eight or nine months old and I was using the McGrath to intubate them. Secretions blocked the view and I decided I would proceed to use it as a direct laryngoscope. I got a grade 2B view, so really only the posterior cartilages were seen. I managed to intubate the child with the stylet above the cartilages and at this stage I decided I was going to swap the tube over to nasal. So there's still a lot of secretions coming up in the airway and at this stage I decided, okay, I'll just use the normal MAC2 blade popped it into the mouth, and I had the easiest grade one view that you could see. So a video laryngoscope, even the McGrath is slightly more angulated than a traditional Macintosh blade. It's thicker, so it is gonna give you a slightly worse view with direct laryngoscopy than a traditional blade. And the final thing to mention with video laryngoscopy, and a big problem that I see, is loss of direct skills. I love teaching uh, video laryngoscopy in terms of training because I can see what my trainees are doing and I can help them during the intubation. We can record the footage and look back at it afterwards and it's brilliant for feedback and I think the learning curve is definitely much quicker with video compared to direct because I have no idea what the problems they're encountering when they do direct. But the big problem I can see with this is we're losing our direct skills. And as I've already mentioned, it's direct laryngoscopy that helps you out when video fails. And I don't really have a great solution to this problem at the moment. I think whenever there is a video laryngoscope that as, is as thin as a traditional direct blade that you can use for direct is probably the way. And then you're going to be able to practice with direct switching to video if things are difficult. What I want to do now is come on to some tips and pitfalls that you want to avoid when you're intubating the critically ill infant. The first is positioning and the traditional teaching is that you probably want to put a shoulder roll in most of these patients to get them adequately positioned. My routine practice is not to do this. If the head's particularly floppy and flopping over to the side, I will put a little nappy under the shoulders more to, to help it in position. But if I'm not having that problem, I don't tend to put a shoulder roll in. It's up to you whether you do or don't do that. But what I would mention is if you are struggling to get a view and you haven't got one in, think about putting one in. And likewise, if you have a shoulder roll in and you're having difficulty with intubation, think about removing it. I can think of a number of times over the last year where one of my colleagues was having difficulty with intubation with a shoulder roll in place. 
And whenever I removed it to do the intubation, it was actually really straightforward to do with the shoulder rolled out. So remember, it can make the view worse as well as better. The other thing is don't forget about external laryngeal manipulation. The larynx in most kids is really, really mobile, um, as you can see in this video. And if you're not doing this, you really should be. And in fact, it really should probably be your airway assistant who is doing it. They'll be able to see the screen as well as you if you're using video laryngoscopy. And this just frees up your hand to deliver the tube. Another really important point, and again, often forgotten, is it takes re a really short time for if you're bagging the patient and putting air down into the stomach for the stomach to expand and completely splint the diaphragm, making ventilation in small babies really, really difficult. So for most small patients, I will put a nasogastric tube in before we start getting them off to sleep. And I will have somebody continuously aspirating it as we're bagging the patient during the apnea period because it's better to prevent a problem than wait till it occurs and deal with it. If you don't decide to put one of these in, you need to have one immediately available and an enteral syringe to remove any air that gets into the stomach without any delay. In terms of the drugs, I tend to keep it fairly simple. I'm using ketamine as the induction agent for most patients, unless they're seizing where I tend to use propofol. In terms of ketamine dosing, again, I like to keep it fairly simple. Critically ill patient, one milligram per kilogram. Peri-arrest hypotensive patient, half a milligram per kilogram. And a child who's running around the place fit and well, two milligrams per kilogram. In terms of muscle relaxant, rocky a milligram per kilogram makes sense because it's going to give you good intubating conditions in a quick time. And as well as a similar volume to draw up as your critically ill patient if you use ketamine 10 milligrams per mil. In terms of atropine, if the patient is young, having bradycardias and particularly sick, I will quite often pre-medicate with atropine. But in all critically ill infants, you're at least going to want to have this drawn up and ready. This is a very long time when you're trying to calculate the dose and draw it up and the kid's bradycardic. And then you're going to need to have something to raise the blood pressure. Critically ill children will decompensate on intubation. Ideally, you're going to resuscitate them beforehand, but sometimes you will get yourself caught out. You'll not realise quite how sick the child is and you give the, the anaesthetic and the blood pressure just bottoms out. So you need something immediately available to bring that up and my preferred drug for doing that is push dose adrenaline. Moving on to some of the equipment, I would strongly recommend using cuff tubes in all your patients. And we've covered this on previous years. You really want to intubate the child once, have a good seal and be able to recruit and oxygenate them well. You do want to have a leak and not be able to bag them and then have to have a period where you've got impaired oxygenation have to go back and upsize the tube. You want to intubate them once and once only. Again, I would strongly recommend using a stylet. There's a few reasons for that. Um, as we've already mentioned, time is of the essence. These kids will desaturate incredibly quickly. If you have a stylet in the tube, you have better control of your tube. Um, you're more likely to get it to go through the cords the first time. Again, small fragile airway. If you're doing lots of poking about with the tube, I've got a nice video showing you this later on. It takes very little time for the airway to swell up. If you're using video laryngoscopy, I think a stylet is mandatory rather than an optional extra and something that I would strongly recommend. And the reason for that, with video laryngoscopy, even with the traditional Macintosh or Miller blade, because of where the camera is, you will get a lovely, highly magnified view of the airway with very little lifting. So once you've got that view, there's no need for you to give a big lift and make a straight passage to the cords. So in that patient, you don't have the same straight passage that you have with direct laryngoscopy. You're still gonna to have to work slightly around a corner. And if you don't have a stilet in the tube, you might struggle with that. And again, you might have to come out, put one in. And again, time is absolutely critical for these patients. In terms of shaping the stilet, I would recommend the straight to cuff position, as you can see in this video. The reason for that is fine movements of your fingertips translate to fine movements of the tip of the endotracheal tube, i.e. you've got good control of it. If you shape the tube how it comes out of the packaging or with a hyperangulated bend that you need for video laryngoscopy, you'll notice that fine movements with your fingers translate to coarse movements of the tip of the tube, i.e. poor control. And that's the reason why you struggle a little bit more to deliver the tube 
uh, with a hyperangulated video laryngoscope around the corner than you do with a straight to cuff tube in a straight passage. In terms of bougie use, I personally prefer a stylet. I know some people do like bougies, but what I would say in this smaller group, I have seen a number of perforations of the trachea and the bronchus from using bougies in these small patients. You'll think that you've got good control of it, but in general, you end up shoving this sharp pointy object down into a small fragile airway, and there is significant risk of you causing trauma. And in general, you will shove it in further than you think you have. So if it's a part of your difficult airway kit that you're very familiar with, by all means, use it. But I would strongly recommend against the routine use of bougies in critically ill infants. I'd mentioned I'd show you a video of a swollen airway. So this was a child where there had been a lot of poking about at the first attempt at intubation. And really the swelling can form in a matter of minutes. And I have been intubating kids after the registrars had a go just one go where there's been a lot of poking and I've tried again after a couple of minutes and I can already see the airway is really swollen and I've been delighted just to get a small on cuff tube in like you can see in this clip where previously there would have been plenty of space for a larger cuff tube. Final thing to before we come on to the post intubation care is in the UK in general it's the responsibility of the anaesthetist to intubate critically ill children but they might not necessarily be the best person to intubate the child. The paediatrician is quite often fairly confident intubating neonates in the neonatal unit and may do this patient of a small infant more regularly than an anaesthetist would. So it is important at the start to discuss who has the best skill set to intubate the child. And importantly, if the anaesthetist is struggling, if you're the paediatrician there and you're confident that you can intubate a neonate, you should put yourself forward and offer your assistance. And I found myself in that position in the past as a paediatric register, seeing the anaesthetist struggle. They're starting reaching for fibre optic scopes and I've said, do you want me to take a look? And again, it was a straightforward grade one airway. So moving on to the post intubation care, and this is a really big one. This is the tube in the right main bronchus, and this is really, really common on children intubated in district general hospitals. It's incredibly high risk of this being the first chest x-ray that you see. It shouldn't really happen, but it does, and there's, it's very good reasons as to why it happens. So going on, if you look at the microcuff tube, provided you're using an appropriately sized microcuff tube for your patient, the depth markers on the tube are really, really accurate in terms of preventing the tube being in too far. And if you've got the tube position, like you can see in the picture here, it is almost never going to be in too far. It might be too high, but I can count on over my career the number of times on one hand the tube adequately positioned at the cord is in actually too far. But when, why do I frequently look at the first x-ray of a critically ill child I've gone out to get and see the tube in the right main bronchus? Well, there's a few reasons. The first thing is they're generally intubated by somebody who's used to intubating adults. And in adults, you push the endotracheal tube in much further than you need to in a child. It's also a stressful scenario, as we've mentioned, and your natural reaction is to shove the tube in that little bit further. You've got a glimpse of the cords and you don't want it coming out. So you have to accept that there's a natural tendency for you to have put the tube in too far. So the best way to detect that is obviously as you're trying to put the tube in, try not to do it, but the chances are you probably still will put it in too far and recognize that. So what I recommend doing after you've done the intubation, by all means come out and bag the child up, but before you secure the tube, go back in and actually have a look and check that the depth markers are adequately positioned. This can be quite difficult with direct laryngoscopy. We're sharing into a little dark hole, trying to pick up the depth markers. With video laryngoscopy, as you can see in the picture here, with a lovely magnified view of the airway, position it correctly should be really straightforward. You're not done here. There is one other place where this is frequently messed up, and that is if you might have it right at this stage, but while you are taping the tube, if you watch, the, the numbers will go in and out like a yo-yo. So whenever you've had that look and confirmed that your tube is adequately positioned, what you need to do is take the blade out and look at the number at the lips at that exact moment and save that number away. 
Then when the tapes are about to go around the tube, you reposition the tube to that number. The chances are it will have moved. And if you do all that, the x-ray of the tube in the right main bronchus should disappear. Another big problem for kids is secretions. And this is absolutely massive. After you've intubated the critically ill child, one of the first things you want to do is go down the endotracheal tube with a suction catheter and clear out the secretions. Be surprised the number of times we go out to the DGHs and the kids on high oxygen, high pressures, and we'll do a suction, we'll maybe do a little bit of chest physio, and once we've cleared things out, you'll notice just how quickly the pressures of the oxygen come down. So make this part of your routine practice after you intubate a critically ill child. And then the final thing I want to come on to is dead space and equipment. So you want to make sure that the equipment you're putting the child on in terms of ventilator is appropriate for the age of the child. So for example, we take a look at the Oxylog here. It can go down to tidal volumes of 50 mils, but most transport teams will not recommend using this on a child under one year or under 10 kilos. And the reason for that is those children do not ventilate particularly well. And we've had a number of patient safety alerts out about putting these smaller patients on the ventilator, even though at 50 mils you could potentially ventilate one of these patients. I know if I'm putting a 10 kilo child on this ventilator, I'm going to dial up 100 mils, so 10 mils per kilo tidal volume. I don't expect the child to see all that 100 mils, but ventilating the circuit and the child and other bits of dead space, that tends to work for me. Another important thing, be careful the circuit. The adult circuit for the, the Oxylog is twice the dead space of the paediatric circuit, so you need to make sure you're using the right one. And if you're using a theatre ventilator or another ventilator, make sure it's appropriate for the size of patients that you're going to be using it for, and that's something you need to sort out in advance. In terms of other sources of dead space, endotracheal tubes, I would encourage you to just ignore. I've never had to cut an endotracheal tube to ventilate a patient, and this is the last thing we want you doing. If you end up with a tube too high, as I've seen in the past, and you've cut it, then we can't actually push it in, and we're going to have to actually change the tube rather than adjust it. So again, don't cut tubes. And there is a lot of other sources of dead space. If you look at the difference between the neonatal and adult and tidal, think of a three kilo child that you're only going to have five, six mils per kilo of tidal volume. That difference is fairly significant. The angle piece is quite surprising, the dead space here, almost 10 mils. So for your three kilo child, that's over three mils per kilo. Half the tidal volume that you're going to be dialing up on the ventilator is in that angle piece. So in general, we don't tend to add these into our ventilator circuits. Another common source of error is using the wrong filter size for the patient. And the numbers here are actually astounding. It tells you on the filter what tidal volume to use each particular filter for. So you can imagine if the, you had a little neonate and you should be using the one with a dead space of 7.8 mils, and actually you put the adult one on with a dead space of 26.6 mils. Most of the tidal volume that you've actually dialed up for this patient is just ventilating this filter. And a, a device that we have seen a number of incidents over the years is the catheter mount, a whopping 44 mils of dead space. So 15 mils per kilo for your little three kilo neonate. And if you put them on this in a volume mode of ventilation, they will not ventilate at all. And we've seen this a number of times over the years. So you really have to just be careful about adding unnecessary things into the circuit. And if you are struggling to ventilate the patient, it's worth going back to hand bagging while you troubleshoot where the actual problem is. And phoning the PICU to talk things through is something that's very useful. Okay, so that was a very quick run through my tips for intubating the critically ill infant. A lot of these will apply to older patients as well, but this talk is specifically aimed at the under ones. So if you have any questions, I'll take them now.